Hello. How's it going? Uh, Dr. Erickson, that was amazing and as a really fun transition, in this week's Science Magazine, there's an article, maybe some of you saw this, an insect that eats plastic. It's a parasite of beehives, right? Transitions are good. Look at that. So it's called a wax moth. Anyone heard of wax moths? Galeria melanella. This is something when I was a student, I was using actually to breed nematodes when I was studying termites. I mean, this is so random and I'm really jumping ahead of myself here. But keep exploring because you never know where this will lead. There was a beekeeper in Spain, I believe, who was taking these pests out of her beehive and putting them in plastic bags. And they were eating through the plastic bags. And that's how this discovery was made. And this is right now, this week. We're just learning this. These wax moths eat up the polyethylene from plastic bags and convert it to ethylene glycol, which can be used as an antifreeze. What? So now you know. Go tell everyone, because we can take these out of the ocean and then transform them into something that can help us run our lives better. Awesome, right? So with that being said, I'd like to start off with a video, if I may. This is coming out of the MIT Media Lab. This was funded by the construction company, Mori Construction, in Tokyo, Japan, that is overseeing the Olympics in 2020, which are our next Summer Olympics, right? Tokyo. Now, Tokyo won that Olympic bid in a time that was very different. It wasn't as sustainable as we are today. It was when Beijing was doing the Olympics. We thought, bigger, better, more money, right? Today we are in a more sustainable world and we don't want to spend, spend, spend. We really want to think about what the future will hold. So these Olympics could be the most sustainable yet. They could be buildings made of 3D printed materials modeled after nature, perhaps beehives. So please go ahead and play that video if you can. We're going to see here something that flips common conversation on its head. So we often talk about what will our world be like without bees. Now, I know that bees are creepy, maybe like this music, right? But it's really important to acknowledge that bees are all vegan. And we need bees for food. So if you eat food, then you like bees. Okay? Now, instead of thinking about our world without bees, Let's think about other like when Bobak was speaking earlier today, thinking about worlds without bees. What if we live on Mars? What are we going to do for food? We're going to need to have some sort of agriculture on new planets. And are we going to be spending our time hand pollinating those crops? Or are there better uses of our time? I think we're going to need pollinators on these planets. We're going to need pollinators more so on our planet as well, because people are already hand pollinating with a paintbrush and a Q-tip going from blossom to blossom to pollinate flowers to bring us fruits and vegetables. So pollinators bring us seeds. And what we're seeing here is this experiment we did in Cambridge, Massachusetts in an abandoned warehouse. The winter of 2015 to 2016, we moved eight beehives from the field into this strange white space. So in collaboration with Neri Oxman, who's an architect and designer, we designed this space to be all white, a pure environment to give new life to bees in a way that we never could think about before because these bees were not able to leave this warehouse and go into the outside environment. Instead, we fed them with artificial food, we simulated their natural environment, and we were able, through some to create new life. We had bees that were born in this synthetic environment. So this is a new type of science and research called synthetic biology. We're trying to better understand the interaction between science and technology and how that can promote life. So instead of doing research that's inspired by science, we're trying to inspire nature itself through science. We want to see how we can improve bee health with these technologies, okay? I know how weird this is, but it is so important because even here on Earth, unlike here in this artificial synthetic apiary, we have challenges with bees dying. 
these are dying off. We're going to talk about that today in a few slides. And you're going to become experts at not only what's killing bees, but so much more importantly, like this video, how to save them. That's the message I want to get across to you today. There's so many lessons we can learn, not if we focus on death and the negatives and the challenges, but if we figure out questions based on those observations, and then you come up with your own hypotheses or answers to those questions, that's where the fun starts. All right, so we'll transition to my slides here. And I'm going to delve in a bit more. Now, getting into bees was not my thing as a kid. I was like many of you who just raised your hands. I was scared of insects, creepy crawly things. I wasn't the kind of kid who played in the dirt. I was the kind of kid who did as I was told. Maybe some of you are like this too. I was the good kid. I just studied hard. I got straight A's. I did everything I was told. And then I still didn't feel like I had a good direction in life. And I felt really confused by that. Because beekeepers, just like scientists and engineers, and each of you, you're actually many things, right? You have interests beyond just what you're studying at any given time. And I want to plead to each of you to not forget any of those interests. That's what makes you who you are. And that's also, as an adult, makes you somewhat bankable, meaning profitable, meaning you could start a company at any time, just as I did. Things that you might feel picked on about as a kid make you a consultant as an adult, right? So I loved this question earlier from the young woman here who was talking about family with a cow and you collected the bones. And maybe some people said, that's kind of weird, right? And some people might say to me, bees are kind of weird, right? Well, if you can come up with some quick statement, like, well, if you eat food, then you need bees, right? And if you have milk in your cereal, then you like cows and you appreciate people who study them, you can really help in a quick way to get people to understand and appreciate the value in your knowledge. What I did as a student was I started a Facebook page for free, and I said, selling beehives, volunteering my time to manage them in exchange for some research funding. And each of those beehives is a data point. So we're able then to understand bee health and look at maps for hot spots of bee health in a way that involves the community and that provides some revenue for something that I just interest in. I had a weird interest in bees because I understood that connection with food. Now, we know that bees are so important not only for food, but for our economy, right? Food is big business, $100 billion worldwide. And that gets the attention of places like here in DC. And here, this is the House of Parliament in Paris, where they have beehives on the rooftop. My company now has 1,000 beehives, mostly on rooftops across the country. And we're studying bee health in ways that we never could before because of the citizen scientist approach. So I want to challenge each of you to go out and talk to people about the things that you know a little too much about and engage them with it. Let's say it's beehives, right? We have the first beekeepers in the White House with the Obama administration. Even the prime minister of Tanzania has beehives. You can show people through leadership what's really important to get across. The knowledge that you have, you have to get creative about because people will be too quick to pick on you for these things. This responsibility is so great because you see decisions like on the island of Hispaniola, what we're looking at here, these decisions lead to environmental impacts. On the left, we have the country of Haiti and on the right, we have the Dominican Republic. You can see a political boundary from above because the implications of our thoughts have real consequences to the environment. So if we can start talking about bees and push this forward, we're really talking about urban ecology. So I consider myself an urban ecologist. And I see a future vision, not only of buildings that will be printed with 3D printers. You can design your house and then have it printed. I think that's inevitable. But I think that we're going to have to start making decisions about our rooftops. And we're going to have to start putting farms there, not just green rooftops, but making them food producing units. It's so important because we have lessons to learn for the future of humanity. Bees are something I got interested in because I didn't have much guidance growing up. My father would say, go to med school, son, then we'll talk. And I would say, dad, if I go to med school, I'm not going to need to talk anymore. I'm going to be locked into a career and then I won't really need advice anymore. I later came to learn that that's what he wanted to do. My father wanted to go to medical school, and I didn't understand that at the time, but I didn't take that advice either. 
So I studied bees because they're social, just like we humans are. Look at us now. We're all coming together and having a dialogue. There's a bit of leadership, like a queen bee. So we can make parallels with other social animals, like bees and wasps and ants, termites. These are social creatures, just like humans. But how have they stayed healthy over the hundred million years that bees have been here? They don't have doctors and hospitals and pharmacists and nurses. So what lessons can we learn? That's what drives us. And it's important to understand bee health because they have challenges. So this is a map of bee health over the years, since 2006, when colony collapse disorder first started. Colony collapse disorder was when bees were dying off and vanishing in mass. It's not even like when one bee died and you see a dead body, but it was a missing body story. So it really got the attention of the general public to say, wait a minute, why are bees vanishing and why are they important? So this has been increasing every year and now we're seeing more summer deaths than winter deaths. It's really important to study, really from an epidemiological perspective as well, if you're interested in diseases and human health, we can look at a map of hot spots for where bees are thriving and where they're dying. And we see the darker states here where there are more rates of bee losses. It's not like an epicenter, so there's a disease starting here and then it's spreading out as an epidemiolo epidemiologist might expect. It's a random pattern. If we don't understand what's happening with bees, then we can't learn these lessons for humans, too. So my own challenges are similar to yours. Raise your hand if you have a grant to pursue your interests right now. This is amazing, and I do see a couple hands, and I applaud you. For everybody else who does not have a grant, I want you to listen carefully to me, because this is how I've made progress without any other opportunities, right? I started a Facebook page. And you can too, these are free. And whatever you know a little bit too much about, you can do, you know, Anne's consulting, Anne's butterflies, whatever you want to do, that's how you get started. And you post information there and people start understanding. So for me, I wanted to understand bee health. There are three main challenges to bee health right now. Disease, bees get many different diseases. We have challenges with agricultural chemicals, such as pesticides and herbicides and fungicides. And then there are also challenges with habitat loss, not enough flowers to feed bees. Now this is so important because here I'm gonna show you this edible experiment relating to habitat. I have three different types of honeys here. Now honey is just flower juice. Two of these three honeys are from my house. I live in Boston. I've come down today to share this with you. So you can taste these on the side table. Now here is a honey that was available by the coffees and teas this morning. It's a liquid honey. And again, this is flower juice. And I have to keep turning it or else it's going to make a mess on the table. So when you're tasting honey, it's concentrated nectar from flowers. And it's really fascinating to understand the science behind honey, really because it's edible and a fun experiment. This is a crystallized honey. So all honeys crystallize over time because of the laws of physics. Honey is a super saturated solution. Everybody say that with me three times fast. Super saturated solution, super saturated solution, super, right? Right? Are we having fun with physics? Okay, cool. So what that means is there's more sugar dissolved in water than is possible by the laws of physics. So the sugars will fall out of solution over time, and they'll separate from a little bit layer of water at the top. Okay? Nectar that bees collect from flowers that's produced in this co-evolutionary relationship between flowers to lure pollinators in, it's about 90% water, 10% sugar. Bees will take water out of it and they'll bring it down to a concentration of about 18 to 20% uh, water. It's very concentrated, so there's a ton of sugar here. This is another type of crystallized honey. It is totally seized up, solid as a rock. Okay, so the difference between these three honeys here is actually in the chemistry now. So we've covered biology and physics. The chemistry has to do with the crystal size. So when the sugars fall out of solution with the water, they're forming crystals of different sizes. Now maybe some of you have seen pollen grains. They're relatively large and they're spiky. And when you just let honey crystallize over time, it will seize up in a very large format like this one. And when you're tasting these at the edible experiment table, 
over here later, I want you to taste the crystal size in terms of the consistency, in terms of the roughness. You can taste it, and that's what's different about this middle thing. This middle honey has a small crystal size compared to this rougher honey with a large crystal size. Now, if you have honey and you don't do anything to it over time, all honeys will form this relatively large crystals. But if you want to add a crystal to initiate that chain reaction, a crystalline chain reaction of food, you can control the consistency so that your honey is very smooth. And that's going to make for a product that people actually prefer Honey's the only food that never goes bad. When I teach my microbiology classes, we start with the honey tasting. So all the students come up and we taste honey and everybody learns that I don't bite. And then we're discussing why honey doesn't go bad. And it's really fascinating because it's not sterile. The sugars here make it a hostile environment. It's so fascinating to study and I want you to taste the difference in honeys. And when you're tasting it, see which honey do I prefer? You make this in a similar way to sourdough bread or to making yogurt when you have a starter. So when you add a little bit of the small crystal honey, that's what continues that chain reaction. So all those crystals are the same size and it stays that way forever. So we're bringing this to market with Whole Foods. Through science, we're improving our food and it's actually the consistency of a frosting, a healthy frosting in a sort of way. So stay tuned for that, taste it here first uh, and really enjoy that. I mentioned here, and we'll go back to the slides, that I started this company when I was a student. I called it Best Bees. I just made it up. If you're not sure what to start your company or your Facebook page or your lab or consulting firm, I do advise you to just pick a name and keep it moving, right? You can change it later. I started with interns. We work with interns who are eligible to receive academic credit, and that's how everybody started on our team. So here's our first group. And we started by surveying groups of beekeepers for best practices and making ugly graphs like this. We asked beekeepers, what are you doing to keep bees healthy? And we got all sorts of responses. And it was a big problem because big data is a huge issue this year next year and in the future when you guys take over our jobs, how to analyze and present data is a challenge. So we've made a lot of progress there in terms of how to analyze it. And we got more and more students on and we wrote a book with Princeton about bees and that really helped us connect with the public in a much better way. I've given talks, TEDx talks, some of you should do these too if you haven't yet, where you can present your own findings and then open up dialogues with others who have some insight into explaining your results. We found amazing things like bees in cities are doing better than bees in the countryside. Bees in cities are doing better than bees in suburban areas. This is a slide from the TEDx Boston talk in 2012, so you can check this out in TED.com. Bees in urban areas make more honey than bees outside of the city and bees in urban areas tend to survive longer. They're also more biodiverse. Bee biodiversity, or the number of bee species, is comparable on rooftops as it is to ground level. It's amazing. So this urban ecology effect seems to be really confusing to many. You might not see cities as areas with robust habitat, but they are. So we've brought on artists to our team, trying to move STEM to STEAM, because it's hard to communicate data in a way that's just ugly, right? So the infographic where we can see jars of honey from urban beehives on the left, urban beehives make more honey on average than suburban in the middle, rural on the right. And the question is why? And I want you to think about this right now. Think about why bees in cities might be doing so well. Keep that in the back of your minds as I show you some data that we've created. Here's another amazing thing. Beehives are doing better the higher up we go. So we're looking at a graph here that's a little tricky because our artist has not yet done an infographic with it. But on the left, we have this is height off the ground going across the x-axis. On the left, the very wide bar, that's the width is the sample size. We have most beehives are on the ground. The black part of the bar is the beehives that survived the winter. As we move to the right, we're getting to the height off the ground. And the tallest black bar is 50 plus feet off the ground. So beehives are doing better. They're surviving more the higher up we go. And we're putting beehives now on skyscraper rooftops across nine cities nationwide. So if you weren't scared of the bees, now you have heights to contend with, right? And this is where we're located. So our urban beekeeping laboratory is in Boston. This is our parking lot. Our landlord is an auto body shop. So we keep beehives on elevator lifts for cars. 
we keep them overhead, and then we lower the platforms down when it's time to work the beehives. Right? You just work with the resources you have. And we started this hashtag online that I want to invite each of you to participate in called Next Gen Beekeepers. This is a nationwide initiative that any of you can engage with. This is our couple from California here. This is Rob and Chelsea McFarland. They're amazing. And they are uh, West Coast beekeepers in Los Angeles where beekeeping was made illegal in 1879. Why might beekeeping have been made illegal? Keep a thought here. Well, we made it legal, thankfully, in 2015, but people saw bees on orchard trees and thought that bees were stealing our food. So in the 1800s, people didn't really understand pollination, right? They saw an insect on blossoms in our orchards and thought, let's make those illegal, right? Now we food comes from. We understand the importance of pollinators, especially with their declining populations, and now beekeeping is legal in Los Angeles. We have an amazing team of next-gen beekeepers around the country, and I want to show you this is what a beehive looks like. They make beekeeper suits for kids these days. Many people think about bees and you picture Godzilla or something very scary, but all bees are vegan. They're not wasps or hornets or yellow jackets. Those are meat eaters. They're cousins. It's like Jurassic Park. All the dinosaurs look pretty scary, but then you see kids petting the brontosaurus and you think, what's that about? So the brontosaurus vegetarians are like the bees, and then you have the T-Rex meat eaters that have to be aggressive to eat. Those are like the wasps and the hornets and the yellow jackets. So bees are safe. And to learn how to become a beekeeper, you need to go to beekeeping school, which is a thing. So find a beekeeping school local to your neighborhood. It's so enjoyable. But I want to teach you a little bit more about the data that we found. So in terms of what's killing bees, we know it's these three things, so pesticides, diseases, and habitat loss, not enough flowers. We did a study with the Harvard School of Public Health to test for pesticides, and we thought, okay, if there are less pesticides in cities, maybe that's what's explaining more bee health. We didn't find that. We see here, this is a result, the larger the pie graph, the more pesticides found in beehives. And Boston is to the right, so that's on the right-hand side of Massachusetts here. And there was a relatively large amount of pesticides in the city. In fact, this orange bar shows the highest amount of pesticides collected in this study was from Boston. So one challenge with urban beekeeping is that people in cities tend to not have training on how to use pesticides, and they spray these freely. So it doesn't seem to explain why bees are doing better in cities, okay? Pesticides, yes, they do kill bees, but their absence doesn't explain their health. And it's so important to consider as we move forward with using our rooftops, how can we incorporate agriculture and food production with our buildings in everyday life? So I want to show you some more of our current team here as we lead up to our big conclusion. This is a great organization you need to know about, Bee Girl. This is Sarah Red Laird. She was picked on as a kid. People would say, oh, there's the bee girl in the cafeteria at school. And she flipped that, that teasing name into now her own company, the Bee Girl Organization. And she travels around the country engaging with kids, engaging with students to do outreach. So reach out to Bee Girl for more programming. She's incredible. We have so many other keepers on staff who have worked together to collect more data. And these people have interests all over the board just like each of you. So while you might be picking one particular interest in STEM, don't lose sight of all of your other interests. You don't have to just pick one thing and that's your identity. Your identity are the things that make up you, everything that you're interested in. We found diseases as a group are also everywhere with bees. So I'm skipping ahead a bit to show you two final projects we're doing. One thing is our smart hive for putting data sensors in bees. We're collecting information, connecting beehives to the internet of things. So we filed a patent here to look at things like temperature, humidity, video. The bees can send us a text message, email, or give us a phone call if they're cold. And we can then text, email, or phone the bees back and say, turn on the heat. It sounds so silly, right? But this is how STEM progress is helping us save bees and get more affordable food everywhere from here to Mars. We debuted these at an amazing tech festival in Boston called Hub Week. This is a solar paneled beehive in collaboration with SUFA, another MIT company spin-off that does solar paneled park benches so you can plug in 
a USB port to charge your phone at a park bench. Pretty cool, right? Maybe you can even charge your cell phone from a beehive. In conclusion, here's our big results. Honey DNA. Okay, we're now sequencing the genome of plant DNA found in honey to understand plant diversity in areas around beehives. We have found more plant species in cities compared to rural areas. So places like Boston, Boston honey we found is mostly linden honey. We're working with National Geographic on this project now. So through sampling honey and the sequencing of the genome of the plant DNA, we can understand what food we're tasting. We know if you taste Boston honey, it's linden tree honey with a little bit of water lily. There's 255 total plant species that bees in Boston are foraging upon. If we look at other areas, we find mostly clover, and you can tell that we've got our artist Paige Mulhern in this. In areas with suburban honeys, we found less than 255 plants in the city. 136 different plant species are found in honey. That's the plant diversity of the habitat there. Mostly holly honey we found in some areas south of Boston. In manicured towns like Newport, Rhode Island, where they trim their hedges, most of the honey in Newport, Rhode Island is hedge honey. This is privet honey. So a message to save bees is don't trim your hedges. Let them go, okay? But 118 different plant species in Newport, Rhode Island. And then we're looking down lastly here at a very manicured area in rural habitat. If you have just a lawn and nothing else, we're finding very low plant diversity and very poor bee health. Only 52 different plant species from this town in Duxbury, mostly daisy honey. So in conclusion, here's what we found for what's saving the bees, plant diversity. We see a significant effect in urban areas with more plant species. So my whole life's work comes down to this one simple message of planting a flower, right? All of this work says plant more flowers and that's really what seems to help save the bees. So when we do go to Mars, when we are making more agriculture, we're gonna need more plant diversity. That's going to give us more food. That's gonna free up our workers from not hand pollinating. And that's going to keep food of prices affordable and inform our own health. I want to thank you guys so much here in closing, and I'm happy to take your questions.